Welcome to Friday Conversation. Today we have Charles Ng, a licensed medical doctor with a Master's of Public Health from Johns Hopkins University. Financial Secretary Paul Chan has mapped out various relief measures, such as handing out consumption vouchers and lowering stamp duty in his latest budget. And the government has also strived to boost its fiscal revenue amid estimated deficit in next financial year. Hello, Charles. Hi. The Hi. Has, the government has planned to reduce stamp duty to help first home buyers get on property ladder. Say stamp duty will be only a hundred dollars for homes worth up to three million Hong Kong dollars. So, do you think the new measure will encourage more young people to buy their own flats and increase in housing demand? Now, this is an excellent measure for aspiring homeowners. Recall 10 years ago, when the property market was overheated, increasing the stamp duty has been one of the ways to manage the demand side of the market. Now that fewer mainlanders and foreigners are buying apartments, the demand in property market is mainly driven by local buyers. Imagine the persona of these buyers, a 20-odd-year-old young adult who just joined the workforce, cohabits with a partner, probably owns a dog or a cat, and above all, aspires to live outside of a traditional extended family, so-called branching out. These are exactly the end users who are most relevant to our system because we want them to fulfill their housing dreams. First start with a smaller studio and then move into a bigger house as they achieve more in society and procreate to form bigger families. Lowering the stamp duty catalyzes just that. What the financial secretary Chan Mao Po has wisely decided is to keep the other harsh measures intact. The property price to income ratio in Hong Kong has remained one of the highest in the world for decades, bar countries with low income and uncontrolled hyperinflation such as Syria and Ghana. Young people find even a flat as small as 20 square meters hard to afford without the help of parents and not everyone is born to well-heeled parents. The least we want to see is another round of property price boom in Hong Kong, because that further widens the chasm between the haves and have-nots. And that is another perfect storm for more social societal unrest. So I think it's a brilliant idea. To boost fiscal revenue, the government will also increase tobacco tax and impose a special football betting duty of 12 billion Hong Kong dollars per year for five years for the Hong Kong Jockey Club. So do you think raising secret tax is a good way to let smokers quit? And will the special betting duty on the jockey club undermine its undertaking to donate to the community? Now, imposing an additional 60 cents per stick of cigarette is effectively doubling the current tax rate. That means a pack of tobacco consisting of 20 sticks of cigarettes, which cost $60 before tax, now cost $78 and will likely be priced at $90 in the near future. From the perspective of a public health doctor, it is of course welcomed. The highest incidence of death in China and Hong Kong is caused by cardiovascular diseases and cancers, both entities closely related to tobacco smoking. It has long been proven that quitting tobacco smoking improves the longevity and the quality of life of patients since fewer people are beset by the complications of chronic illnesses. Gratefully, we've seen a marked decrease in smokers and a subsequent increase in quitters since the tobacco tax has first been imposed. Of course, that has coupled with legislation of prohibiting smoking in indoor public places and workplaces. But against the backdrop of an aging population, disease prevention and delaying the onset of age-related chronic illnesses is the most efficient way of buying time for the government to reform the health system in a way that is more fiscally sustainable. The Health Bureau has also published a primary healthcare blueprint to that end. And for the majority of people in Hong Kong who clearly prefers a healthy lifestyle, it is fair for the government to use the windfall from tobacco tax to build a healthier living environment rid of air pollution. As for introducing an additional football tax on Hong Kong Jockey Club, I think it is absolutely the right thing to do. Collecting $2.4 billion dollars a year more from charity savings of more than $44 billion in the coffers amounts to only 5% of the reserves. Hong Kong Jockey Club now holds a monopoly business, and by the way, they should thank the government for issuing the license, and is only taxed 50% of their gambling revenue, compared to Macau, where gambling business is highly competitive among more than 30 casinos. They are taxed at 40% of their revenues. If Jockey Club fails to innovate new business entities that can provide better services at a lower cost and high efficiency should gradually enter and split part of their market, just like any 
healthy business environment in most other industries work. And this is only made possible under the one country, two systems policy. The government has planned to increase also the allowance, tax allowance per child by 10,000 Hong Kong dollars to 130,000 amid the low birth rate in Hong Kong recently. Do you think more young couples will be encouraged to have their babies? And do you have any other measures to boost local birth rate? Now, many people think it is too little to create meaningful incentives for young couples because one ten thousand dollars um, of uh, deductible amounts to at most uh, seventeen hundred dollars less tax paid per year at the highest tax brackets, which involves the majority of middle class families. That may be enough for three nursery classes. For those who are unfamiliar, a six month old child starts taking eight nursery classes a month, each costing $500. And that's about 100 nursery classes for the first year. Nevertheless, given the financial restraints, we all know the government reported huge deficits at $140 billion last year. It is one baby step towards uh, forward. And that signals the government cares about birth rates. Hong Kong's birth rate currently sits at 0.9 per woman, way below the 2.1 required to achieve demographic balance, and that is the number of newborn required to break even with deaths. It is almost the lowest in the world, bar South Korea. Europe, even with an average birth rate of 1.6, has shown how aging population can powerfully douse a strong economical engine. Demographic decline is not unique to Hong Kong, but Hong Kong fares very badly in this aspect. Many young couples decided to rear a pet instead of a child, and eventually low birth rate will decrease labor force, slow the economy, push up pension costs, and overwhelm the health system. If saving people's lives start from disease prevention, encouraging childbirth must start from giving fertile grounds for newly wedded young adults to bear children. Now, start with affordable house prices. Most young adults cannot afford more than 30 square meters, and that is hardly a conducive environment to rear children. Second, a child's educational cost has also skyrocketed over the last two decades, putting off aspiring parents. This may prove to be one of the more important levers to pull. Third, create a work-life environment for women conducive to working from home. This should have been made an easier transition by the adaptations to COVID. Also, people have placed undue faith in fertility technologies, and they're ex expensive. But if changing the culture takes time, subsidizing some of the more effective technologies may prove temporary relief to remedy an ultra-low birth rate. Finally, Porchen is giving away a new round of uh, consumption vouchers in its third consecutive year. And Hong Kong and Macau probably are the places where people still have consumption vouchers after COVID. Uh, is it necessary for the government to handle such vouchers and how can it speed up our economic recovery? Since the second round, many of the people whom I've known used octopus, octopus cards to get the vouchers and in turn used them for transportation, namely mass transit railway or um, KMB, the buses. The second most used I've heard of is buying bread for breakfast in Boulangerie. Some others use it to get lunch in Cha Chan Teng, Hong Kong style cafes. That contrasted with the first round when people bought branded clothes, electronics, and accessories. Of course, one can always say we need more data research, but let's strip it down to very simple terms. Consumer psychology. The first round of vouchers were issued at a time when Hong Kong citizens could neither fly in or out. They felt like extra free money could satisfy a sort of guilty pleasure, basically splurging on extravagant stuff. The second round was much less impactful because people were already sated. And more of them realized by spending on commodity or pedestrian stuff, such as city dwelling, they could actually use up the pool of vouchers before they expired. Shops evolved too. During the first round, many high-end malls and shops offered hefty discounts. But when it came to the second round, many of those reverted to the usual level of discount before the, pan the pandemic. To consumers, splurging on quality goods suddenly became a less attractive option as opposed to using vouchers on commodity products. Now, the third round is expected to have even less impact. Now that people are allowed to travel, many would save up for another trip after a three year long lockdown. Even fewer would spend on local quality goods or services. It is expected that more people would use it on public transport instead. And just as some legislators phrase it, 
only a narrow field of businesses would benefit from consum consumption vultures. In fact, paid for by none other than Hong Kong's taxpayers. At worst, it is value for gone that goes down the drain, and at best, it placates some populists who advocate fervently for the distribution of consumption vouchers as tokenism that they have helped reboot Hong Kong's economy. Now that it is decided the government will hand out these consumption vouchers, perhaps more thought should be put on how best to direct money to industries that are crucial to Hong Kong's future growth. Thank you, Charles. That is the end of today's program. If you like our program, please like, share, and subscribe our Friday Everyday channel. I'm Henry Ho. See you next time.